Now, obviously, when it comes to anything that we're doing to improve our relationship with our spouses, our relationship with our families and our friends, and ultimately our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are going to be many different things that can get in the way. Part of doing this work of self-improvement, and especially in the way of love, is recognizing that these blockades that we have are not permanent and that we can overcome them. The first step to overcoming these blockades is recognizing that we have to figure out what the blockades are. And so here are some different considerations when it comes to performing these acts of uh, performing these love, lang love languages. So the first thing that can get in the way of our first love language, acts of service, is selfishness. Selfishness is something that in Islam we're very often trying to break. Our nefs or our ego is constantly trying to get us to focus directly on what our needs are and ignoring all others. It's much easier to do that because then we don't have to burden ourselves and quote unquote, waste our time with other people's needs, which can be emotionally exhausting. But if you have, if you are someone who recognizes that acts of service is perhaps a weakness of yours or the people around you who you care the most about have the love language of acts of service, it's important to let go of that selfishness and work through breaking that ego to provide time with them. One way you can do that is, to, is by actually scheduling and setting boundaries around what your acts of service are. So it might not mean that every time someone needs help with something that you offer yourself as a volunteer, but it might mean that you know, for example, that your mom does laundry every Thursday morning. Well, you make it a point that if you are available Thursday morning, then you're going to help with that. Maybe help load the washing machine, maybe help fold the clothes afterwards, whatever it might be. Scheduling in those acts of service can make them much more manageable and help you to, on a very consistent basis, speak that love language to the people you love. Quality time is the second love language that we can think about. And what can get in the way of quality time? One is obviously busyness. Being busy is going to get in the way of any opportunity to free up time. If you are dealing with a lack of quality time with your spouse, and quality time is third love language, it can be very distressful. Many couples also find themselves having countering schedules. So maybe, for example, you work a morning shift and your spouse works a shift where they come home much later in the evening. It can be very hard to find yourself having time that you overlap to connect. But there is no such thing as impossibility. So when it comes down to it, if you are finding yourself having trouble, sit down with an actual calendar and figure out what time do we have where both of our schedules are overlapping and we can spend time together. This might mean that you are spending time during more inconvenient moments. Perhaps it's an early morning awakening for one person. But at the end of the day, if this is your husband or wife, that time is very special and important. And that sacrifice goes a long way in maintaining a relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treasures very much. Another thing to think about when it comes to quality time, which might not come to mind initially, is for people who are struggling with mental illnesses such as depression or anxiety, that experience of loneliness can really take away from their ability to enjoy quality time. One thing we know in mental health studies is that those who suffer from depression and anxiety disorders are more likely to isolate themselves. Now, there are two different players in this game. If you are the person who finds that you isolate yourself as a response to depression or anxiety, then it's very important to try to think of different ways to counter that isolation. Maybe it doesn't mean that you physically take yourself over a friend's house, but maybe it means calling a friend for five to 10 minutes or making a point to message someone to create those little spaces and pockets of quality time so that you're not completely isolated during this time. On the other hand, if you are someone who knows a person who's struggling with depression or anxiety, who tends to isolate themselves, it's important for you to create those opportunities, even if it means that those opportunities can end up getting rejected. So it might mean inviting the person over and being okay if they say no, or noting that if they do say no, you offer another time. Hey, I understand that you don't want to come over today. I'm available this night or this weekend if you are free. And hopefully they take that opportunity and you're able to build that connection. Moving on to the next love language, words of affirmation. What can tend to get in the way of our ability to affirm one another with words of affirmation are a lot of very harsh cultural ideologies. 
So some of us might have come from cultures or family dynamics where using words of affirmation was looked down upon, where often instead of being very affirming and saying words like, I love you, I care about you, I'm proud of you, we would use insults or aggressive tone. This is very difficult to manage because after many years of experiencing this, you may not even notice that you are someone who's extremely affirming. But like all things, with practice, we're able to mitigate the difficulties that come with this type of language. So if you are someone who finds that words of affirmation are very difficult for you, it takes a pattern of noticing when it is that you want to use aggressive language or harsh words and catching that moment. And maybe during the first few times, all you can do is catch it, but you still say the harsh words or the use aggressive language. But then after a few times, you find that now you can hold back from saying harsh words altogether. And then you start adding kind words. So instead of saying something like, gosh, that was so stupid, you say something like, oh, that was really silly. If you notice something that you appreciate, making it a point to say, wow, I really appreciate that, or I really find that beautiful or kind. So these are opportunities, just like anything else, to use the process of conditioning to make words of affirmation a greater part of your language and ultimately a greater part of your life. And you'll see a lot of benefits that come from that. When it comes to the love language of touch, there are two major considerations of what can get in the way of your ability to speak this love language. One is similar to words of affirmation. Perhaps you grew up in a culture or in a family dynamic where touch was just not something very common. You guys didn't hug very much in your family. Or if you ever did try to hug or kiss someone in your family, you kind of got pushed away. And that can make it very scary to try to endure that in the future. And we might find ourselves saying things like, I don't need touch or I'm not a very touchy person. On the other hand, it might be much more severe than that, where you or someone you know has experienced some type of sexual trauma. Uh, this can go as far as rape, and it can be lesser than rape, including molestation, or being touched in a, in a time when you just weren't comfortable. Sexual trauma can be very difficult to manage, and I do recommend very highly if you are someone who's experienced sexual trauma, and you're finding that this is getting in the way of you being able to express touch as a love language, especially to a spouse, then you take the time to find someone who you are able to work through with this, specifically a counselor, counselor or a trauma-focused coach. The last love language that we are going to talk about, inshallah, is gifts. What can get in the way of gifts? So first and foremost, because of our typical idea that a gift has to be something monetary, not having much money can definitely get in the way of gifts. And this is a very practical consideration. Another thing that can get in the way of gifts that often we don't really think about is you just might not ever think to get a gift for someone. If it wasn't, again, a part of your culture or family dynamic, then getting gifts might seem to be a little more burdensome because it's something you have to actually go out of your way to do. You have to get up and go to the store. You have to go online and order something, or you have to make a note that while you're walking or in, out and about to think of someone and say, hey, I'm going to actually make the intention to get this item for this person. When it comes to that difficulty, honestly, my best advice is create little reminders in your calendar or your phone to buy something. If you can, and if you're someone who budgets uh, with a weekly or monthly budget, create a small little budget for gifts and use that budget to decide how much you're going to spend on gifts for the people you love. Create a list of who those who are deserving of gifts are in your life. Perhaps it's someone who's a very close friend to you. Maybe you're married and that's a person you're going to decide to give gifts to. Another thing to think about is create a list of different gifts that you can offer to people. Gifts don't have to be monetary. It might truly be something you have in your home that, for example, you don't find yourself getting a lot of use of, but you think someone else can get much more use out of it. It can be something that was meaningful to you that you you made. It can be a picture that you printed out at a local pharmacy or a local photo store and you get it framed and you give it to someone. There are so many different options for gifts to show that you are actually thinking of someone. 